Things are dissolved in water. Everything in life is dissolved in water. I mean, uh, the cytoplasm in our cells is water. All the carbohydrates, the proteins, everything, they're dissolved in water. So when I work in lab, everything is in water solution. And so you need to understand what those solutions are, how you make them, and then the numbers, the, the calculations that go with them. Also, just in a straight chemistry lab, usually reactions are done in solution. If you take two powders and mix them together and expect them to react, you're probably going to be waiting a long time. Usually you have to dissolve them in a liquid to make a solution and then they'll react. So a, a solution is a type of a mixture. So the first week of class, we talked about mixtures. We had homogeneous mixtures and heterogeneous mixtures, and we left it at that. We said a homogeneous mixture is the same throughout. A heterogeneous mixture is not the same throughout. But if we want to type, break up the types of mixtures really and classify them, not just based on how they appear, but also what makes them up, we have three classifications. We have suspension, colloidal suspension, and a solution. So a suspension is, just as it sounds, it's particles suspended in a liquid. Okay, That's all it is. Like sand and water? Exactly. They're not dissolved. They're just, at that point in time, are floating in the liquid. A suspension, given time, will settle. Okay. If you can set it on the bench, come back later, and there's stuff at the bottom of your beaker, that's a suspension. A colloidal suspension is very similar to a suspension, but the particles are so small that they never settle. They're there. They're not technically dissolved. They're floating around in the liquid, but they don't settle. And so what we have here is a picture of a suspension. It's cloudy. Right? The particles are big enough that you can see them, it's cloudy. A colloid, you may or may not be able to see the particles. It may have a, just a little bit of cloudiness to it. It's certainly not like a suspension, but what is there will not step. Like blood? Mm, blood, blood, there's, there's two, two things there. If you consider the blood cells, red blood cells and white blood cells, as part of the blood, yeah. that would be a suspension. Because the cells will settle out. But if you're dealing with plasma, plasma just has carbohydrates and proteins and salts dissolved in it. That would be a solution. Colloids are not all that common in real life. The best example I can come up with, and this isn't even probably technically correct, is milk. Milk has particles of fat dissolved in it. It's not even dissolved. They're floating around, but they don't settle. Has anyone ever seen raw milk? Probably not. It separates. You get the cream on the top. That, that's where the, the cream rises to the top phrase comes from. You, have, you end up with the milk on the bottom and the cream on top. When you buy Buy it at the store, it says homogenized. Have you ever wondered what homogenized means? They take that raw milk and they they break the particles, the fat particles up into really, 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 really small pieces. It's so small that they don't rise to the top. Because they're oil, they wouldn't sink, they would rise. They're so small that forces on them aren't great enough to make them separate. In, in science, in, when you really get into research, you'll work with some colloids. That's not something we'll use in, in, in the lab. Probably not anything you'll ever use in whatever profession you go into. But solutions are everywhere. So a solution has something that is dissolved in the liquid. It is completely homogeneous. There are no visible particles. No matter whether you look at it with a microscope, no matter what you're looking at it with, you will not 
fine particle. It's transparent. You can see through it. It may be colored, but you can see through it. It's not cloudy. A solution, a true solution, will never be cloudy. So solutions, we normally think of as something dissolved in a liquid. You can dissolve salt in a liquid. You can also dissolve a liquid in another liquid, like ethanol dissolves in water. So a solution is technically any compound dissolved in another compound. So here is a simple solution. We just have salt, sodium chloride dissolved in water. That's a solid dissolved in a liquid. Air is actually a solution. It's a gas solution. There's multiple gases dissolved in other gases. So for just air, what's the, the primary component of air? Nitrogen. So air would be a solution of all of the other gases dissolved in nitrogen. If you're going to give oxygen to a patient, you're probably not going to give them pure oxygen. You need to dilute it a little bit. And so there's going to be other gases in there, primarily nitrogen and CO2. Those are comp components of the air, and so it's certainly safe to give them to your patient, but it's just the ratios are different than normal air. They kind of increase the amount of oxygen, decrease everything else. You can also have a solution of a solid in a solid. And so is there anybody that has any of these titanium screws in their mouths? No? OK. It looks painful, doesn't it? It's not pure titanium, though. Pure titanium doesn't have the right properties for medical purposes. But if they put some other metals into it, very small amounts of it, they can tweak how brittle it is, how flexible it is, how strong it is, how reactive it is. And so these screws and pins normally have a little bit of vanadium and aluminum added to them. They're safe, but by changing the amount of vanadium and aluminum you add to the titanium, you can very drastically change the properties of the pin. The solutions that we're going to be talking about, I think from here on out, anything we're going to use in lab will be a standard something dissolved in a liquid solution. So when we talk about a solution, we have to define some things. So a solution is a homogeneous mixture. You're not going to find a homogeneous mixture that is not a solution. In the solution, we have two parts. We have a solute and a solvent. The solute is the thing that gets dissolved, and the solvent is the thing that does the dissolving. So the solute is dissolved into the solvent. The easiest way to think about it is whichever one you have more of, that's the solvent. The thing you have less of is the solute. So if you dissolve, well, let's go back. In this situation, what is the solute? The solvent. The, the sodium chloride. So the solvent would be water. water. Over here, what would you say was the solvent? Oxygen. oxygen. It looks now like there's more oxygen than anything else. And so I would say oxygen is the solvent. And over here, the solvent is the titanium. An aqueous solution is just a solution where the solvent is water. So that little AQ that you put as a state symbol all the time, that's just saying it's a solution, it's something dissolved in water. So looking in this picture, we don't know what this is, we don't know what that is. But which one is the solute? Which one is the solvent? Water is the solvent. The liquid is the solvent. It certainly looks like it's probably salt dissolving in water. But the liquid is the solvent. The solid here is the solute. Next we have to talk about solubility. Solubility is a measure of how well 
something dissolves in a solvent. How much of a certain solute can you dissolve in your solvent? Remember, an ionic compound, when you dissolve it in water, is going to break apart. Molecular compounds won't. An insoluble compound, remember our solubility table, if you have insoluble, if you put it in the water, it won't dissolve. The ionic insoluble compound will not dissociate. But the solubility for ionic compounds is not all that predictable. I mean, remember there was the rules and then the exceptions. And I dare you to look at the periodic table and figure out a pattern in those exceptions. You're not going to do it. People had to just test them and figure out which things are soluble in water, which things are not. So here, remember, are our rules and the exceptions. So chloride, bromide, and iodide are soluble except when they're paired with silver, mercury, and lead. So those three elements paired with a chloride is insoluble. There's no pattern there. You're not going to find it. Not only is there, do we talk about soluble versus insoluble, but we're going to talk about how much you can dissolve and also how quickly something dissolves. So we can change how quick something dissolves, we call that a rate of solution, by doing three things. Number one, we can heat the solution up. If you raise the temperature, in almost all cases, solubility is going to go up. So if you've ever made jello, you heated it up. If you ever tried to make jello without heating the water, you would still be making jello not in class right now. It's not going to work. You have to heat it up in order to get that gelatin dissolved. You can also increase surface area. So this is sugar in granulated, granulated form and also sugar cubes. Which one of these two has the greater surface area? The, uh, these, these, the cube or the granulated has greater surface area? Granulated. Imagine there's the same amount of sugar in one of these cubes or in a pile of sugar crystals. Each sugar crystal has water touching it when you put it in the, into the water. If you drop a cube into a glass of water, only the sugar on the outside of that cube is going to be touching the water. And for it to dissolve, it has to be touching the water. And so when you drop the cube in, the outside will dissolve. The outside layer of molecules will dissolve. And then the next layer, and then the next layer, and the next layer. But if you have granulated sugar and you drop that in, every single sugar crystal is going to start dissolving at the same time. And so increased surface area will increase how fast something dissolves. And the last one is mixing. If you ever made Kool-Aid, if you just dump the packet into the water and put it in the refrigerator, when you came back an hour later, you'd be one very disappointed kid. You just have a bunch of sugar sitting at the bottom and you, you, would, you wouldn't be able to drink it. You had to stir, right? As soon as you started stirring that, everything in there dissolves really quickly. Sugar dissolves quickly. The whatever actually makes Kool-Aid, Kool-Aid dissolves very quickly also. That kind of leads us to electrolytes. Where do you, well, we talked about electrolytes last week, right, in, in the lab. So you tested which things were electrolytes and which were not. We learned what makes something an electrolyte. But in real life, where do you hear the term electrolytes all the time? Gatorade. 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 So now that you know what an electrolyte is, what can you take from what we learned and apply it to what Gatorade is trying to, to sell you? They were replenishing some of the stuff you are sweating on. Yes. And so the key word is salt, right? Salt is an electrolyte. 
Electrolyte drinks have salt in them. Big whoop, right? It's a marketing tactic. You would have to su sweat so much to lose so much sweat that it was a, so much salt that it was a problem. You'd probably die of dehydration, right? Because for this that salt to come out, water has to go with it, and the water is a lot more important to you than the salt is. So remember, an electrolyte is just a solution that conducts electricity, and there were two types. You have strong electrolytes and weak electrolytes. The difference is how much they dissociate. A strong electrolyte completely dissociates, like sodium chloride or salt. The sodium and the chloride completely dissociate. Every single sodium and chloride in there separate. A weak electrolyte is something that is soluble, but does not completely dissociate. So this is not going to be an ionic compound. An ionic compound is either soluble and completely dissociates, or insoluble and won't dissolve at all. If you have molecular compounds, some of them, a small number of them, can somewhat dissociate. What was the best example of a weak electrolyte that you remember from lab last week. It had a smell to it. What was the only one that had a smell? Oh, I forgot about the alcohol. Yeah, the alcohol had smell also. It's not, not the ethanol, though. You used two concentrations of it. Did that help? It was on, it was on the post lab. Did that help? <laughs> Acetic acid, yes. Acetic acid is a molecular compound. That is not an ionic compound, but there is one hydrogen on acetic acid that likes to come off. That's why it's an acid. I mean, an acid has to make, has to make hydrogen ions, we've learned. And so some of those hydrogen ions will come off. If you have a million acetic acid molecules, though, maybe only 100 to 200 of them will dissociate. The rest won't. So that's why it's a weak electrolyte. If you add the same amount of acetic acid to a solution and the same amount of sodium chloride to a solution, the sodium chloride will be a better electrolyte. It will conduct better because they've all broken into ions. Remember that the more ions you have in solution, the better you conduct electricity. With the acetic acid, only a few of them are broken apart, and so you have only a few ions floating around. And then there is the non-electrolyte. That is an ionic compound that doesn't dissolve at all, or it's a molecular compound that, whether it dissolves or not, doesn't break apart. So a molecular compound, if it doesn't dissolve, it's non-electrolyte. If, if it dissolves, but doesn't dissociate, it's also a non-electrolyte. So this is essentially what you did but just with a big bulb instead of a little bulb. If you have a solution down here with ions in it, it will allow electricity to go from one pole to another, completing the circuit and elating your light bulb. So this is a molecular compound that is soluble, but it is not an electrolyte at all. This is hydrogen peroxide. Hydrogen peroxide is H2O2. It's a liquid. Pure hydrogen peroxide is a liquid, although what you buy at the store is a solution in water, not pure hydrogen peroxide. But when you put it in the water, it goes from H2O2 liquid to H2O2 aqueous. It does not break apart. So when you're dissolving things and you're trying to figure out how well something is going to conduct electricity. You have to figure out how many ions you are making. So if you dissolve zinc chloride into water, what ion are you going to get? Zinc and chloride. You're going to get zinc and chloride. How many of each? One zinc, two chloride. One zinc, two chloride. So if we're going to write a formula or a reaction for the dissolving of zinc chloride, yeah, solid. it would just be zinc chloride solid 
it's going to give us zinc ion aqueous plus two aqueous chloride ion. That's all it is. Just break it apart. What about potassium nitrate? What are you going to get from potassium nitrate? Potassium and nitrate. Potassium and nitrate, how many of each? One of each. One potassium and one nitrate. C2H5OH. That is ethanol. What is that going to be when you dissolve it in water, do you think? Yes. 2C5H is an OH. No. Is it C2H? Do you remember, was ethanol a non electrolyte, a weak electrolyte, or a strong electrolyte out there? Electrolyte in lab last week. Non. It was a non electrolyte. At least it was supposed to be. So, if it was a non electrolyte, what does that tell you about how many ions it breaks into? It doesn't. And so, just like hydrogen peroxide, we're going to go from a liquid. That's all that changes. The state symbol changes. The formula does not. It's not going to break apart. These waters aren't public. They didn't even put it here. So. We have three things that change how quickly something dissolves. Remember, there's temperature, surface area, and stirring, or mixing. There are also three things that affect how much of a solute you can dissolve in your solvent. One of them is also temperature. Temperature is going to affect this also. The other two are different. Number one is structure. This one is probably the most complicated. We'll talk more about that. Then there's temperature. What do you know, or what from your experience, if you heat water up, can you dissolve more or less of something in it? More. more. You know that when you heat the water up, not only is it going to dissolve faster, but you're probably going to be able to dissolve more in it. And then pressure is also going to have an effect, but only if your solute is a gas. Okay, dissolving a gas in a liquid. If you're dissolving a liquid or a solid in a liquid, pressure has no effect whatsoever. So these are two structures. These are organic chemistry structures. This is not anything you would ever have to draw in this class. But I want you to look at these two structures. This is a molecule, okay? Single lines or single bonds, double lines or double bonds. This is one big molecule. This is vitamin A. That smaller one over there is vitamin C. If you look at these two molecules, the more atoms that you have that are not carbon or hydrogen, the more polar that molecule is going to be. And so if you look at these two, which one do you think is going to be more polar? Vitamin C is more polar. Not only are there more oxygens, but there are actually fewer carbon hydrogens also. So it's kind of, you're looking for that ratio, the carbon, the carbon hydrogen compared to everything else. The more of the everything else category you have compared to the carbon hydrogen, the more polar it's going to be. And how polar something is, is, is going to determine what solvents it dissolves in. So these are two vitamins. The, you ever heard that there are two classes of vitamins? Does that sound familiar? Yeah, insoluble and soluble. Soluble and insoluble. Not only, I've, I've heard other, other terms. Fat soluble. Fat soluble and water soluble, yes. Or lipid soluble and water soluble, same thing. So, what that means is one of these is going to dissolve in water, the other is going to dissolve in oil. Is water polar or nonpolar? Polar. 
So which of these do you think is the water soluble vitamin? Vitamin C. Vitamin C. This is the more polar vitamin, so it's going to dissolve in the polar solvent. Okay, that, that's going to be our rule. Like dissolves like. Polar things dissolve in polar solvents. Nonpolar solutes dissolve in nonpolar solvents. This is a very nonpolar molecule. So this is our lipid sol soluble vitamin. Lipids are fats are very non-polar. This is a fat molecule. All the blacks are carbons, the whites are hydrogens, the reds are oxygens. And so the vast majority of that is non-polar. There is a little bit of polar end on it, but Overall, it's very, very, very non-polar. Has anyone ever made soap before? Nobody was born in the 1600s? <laughs> Sometimes you, people do it in high school in, in, in the lab. So if you make soap, you actually take fats and oils, and you modify them just a little, just a little bit, not very much at all. It makes this end a little bit more polar, so it's not drastic, but this end becomes a little bit more polar. And so what you end up with is a molecule that's very, very, very nonpolar over here and polar on that end. And because it's so big, the two ends of the molecules actually can behave almost independently. And so this end will dissolve in fat or grease. This end will dissolve in water. And so that soap molecule will essentially act as glue holding the grease to the water to take it off your hands, off your pans, and things like that, and down the sink. So this is oil floating on top of water. Why do you think oil and water don't mix? They're not like each other. They're not like each other. So which one's which? Water is polar. Oil. Water's polar. Oil, which you, you have no reason to know what oil actually is, must be nonpolar. Essentially, oil is a mixture of compounds that are made up of carbon and hydrogen. They're what we call hydrocarbons. That's all they are. And so they're very, very, very nonpolar, and so that's not going to mix. This is CCL4. I did look at CCL4 is not chloroform. Chloroform was the other thing I mentioned, the CHCl3. So this is carbon tetrachloride, carbon tetrachloride. And this is C6H14, which is hexane. If you mix them together, they're soluble together. So what does that tell you about the polarity of these two things? They're the same. If they dissolve, they must be the same. So now we need to figure out are they both polar or are they both nonpolar? A couple ways we can look at it. How do you want to do it? Um, you could just switch. Okay. My suggestion, we, we know they're the same, right? So if we can look at one or the other and figure out whether one of them is polar or nonpolar, then the other one automatically must be the same thing. So do you want to figure out whether carbon tetrachloride is polar or whether hexane is polar? Carbon tetrachloride. Carbon tetrachloride. I heard that one first. Is carbon tetrachloride polar or nonpolar? Non. It's nonpolar. Because the four chlorines are equally spread around that carbon, it's symmetrical. Even though the bonds are polar, the molecule, remember, is nonpolar. So if this is nonpolar, that must be nonpolar. But could we have known that hexane was nonpolar? Yes. Yes, how? And carbon hydrogen. Carbon hydrogen. Remember, carbon hydrogen is that is that is that exception. Carbon hydrogen bonds are nonpolar. And so if you have a compound made entirely of carbon and hydrogen, all of the bonds are nonpolar. 
And so the molecule itself must be nonpolar. People have an artsy thing of oil and vinegar sitting on their kitchen window. Nobody? One. Yes. Is there, is there like some herbs in it too? No, you don't have the herbs in it? Oh, my grandma does. Your grandma's got the herbs in it. This is the same thing. You've got, you've got olive oil floating on top, and then probably vinegar on the bottom. How many people like, like Italian dressing? Or have at least used Italian dressing, whether they liked it or not? What's the first thing you have to do? Shake it. Shake it. Because in the refrigerator, it looks like that. And if you just pour it like that, you're going to get all olive oil, and the people at the end are going to get all vinegar, and they're not going to be very happy. Right? So the olive oil is nonpolar. Vinegar is acetic acid, which is polar, but it's also dissolved in water. Vinegar is a dilute solution of acetic acid. And so this is very polar, that's very nonpolar, so they don't. So this is our like dissolves like. Right? If you have a polar solute, it's going to dissolve in a polar solvent. A nonpolar solute will dissolve in a nonpolar solvent. So ionic, an ionic compound is always polar. There is no such thing as a nonpolar ionic compound. And so an ionic compound is only going to be soluble in a polar solvent. If you have a molecular compound, you have to figure out is this a polar molecular compound or is it a nonpolar molecular compound? The polar will dissolve in the same things as the ionic compounds. The nonpolar molecular compounds will only dissolve in the nonpolar solvents. So which ones of the three would dissolve in water? Polar. Polar and ionic. And ionic. Yes. So these two will dissolve in water. Water is a polar solvent, and so these two would. Of these two, which which ones, if any, would you expect to dissolve in water? Neither. Yeah, neither. We've got neither. So let's, let's look at them independently. So I2 is probably the easier one. Would you expect I2 to dissolve in water? No. no. It's two of the same element together. That's very, very, very nonpolar. This is more questionable. First of all, is it ionic or molecular? It's molecular. And so is it polar? Or is it nonpolar, do you think? Nonpolar. Don't forget about that oxygen. That oxygen is going to make it polar. And so what we have there is we have a carbon three hydrogens and an OH. Is that polar or nonpolar? Polar. Now you can probably see it's polar, right? That is definitely not symmetrical. So that is methanol. And so would you would you expect methanol to dissolve in water? Yes. Yes. Which one of these would you expect to dissolve in benzene, which is C6H6? Neither. I don't know. The iodine. The iodine. C6H6 is going to be very nonpolar because it's just carbon and hydrogen. Those are all nonpolar bonds. So, so we have a nonpolar solvent, which will dissolve the nonpolar solute. You already know the effect of temperature. That effect actually does not apply to all solutes. And believe it or not, sodium chloride is the exception. Temperature does not affect the rate at which sodium chloride, how much salt you can dissolve in water. It does apply to almost all ionic solids. That if you raise the temperature of the water, you'll be able to dissolve more. Gases, though, are the opposite. You have to remember. The solids and the gases are opposite. 
Solids are more soluble in hot water. Gases are less soluble in hot water. So this is a graph showing how much gas you can dissolve in water. So on the bottom we have our temperature. Up here we just have how much gas we can dissolve. It's measured in grams of gas per 100 grams of water. So as we go up, you can very clearly see that the amount of gas is going to drop. In Florida, this is really important because most of our lakes are very shallow. And so they heat up very quickly. Not only is it hot, but they're shallow. So as the lake gets hotter and hotter, the oxygen, it dries up, but even before then, all of the oxygen is going to leave the lake. And so we'll have fish kills. This happens a lot around here. Lake Weir, anybody from Ocala? Lake Weir is known for this. They lose the oxygen in the water, and then all, a lot of the fish will die. Anybody? Bass fish. Fish for bass. Have a bass boat with a live well in it. So I do, OK? If I fish a tournament in the summer, the way tournaments work is you catch the fish, you keep them in the boat alive until the end of the day. Everybody weighs them together, and then you release them, OK? There's a penalty if they die. You do not want to kill the fish. And so if you're fishing in the Florida summer, and you catch a fish at 8 o'clock in the morning, and you need to keep that fish alive until 3.30 in the afternoon, when it's 95 degrees out, it's a problem. Not all, the, the, the boats have pumps in them to put air into the water, but if it's so hot, most of the air just bubbles through and nothing ever dissolves. And so we have to carry ice with us to continuously put ice on the fish. So that does two things. One, it slows their metabolism down, so they need less oxygen, but it also brings us down to the left of this graph. And so we get more and more oxygen dissolved. If we don't do that, a lot of our fish are going to die. Do you have a question? No, that's what my dad does. He does ice on the boat. Yeah. So pressure is the other thing that affects solubility of gases in water. Again, like I said before, this does not apply at all to liquids or solids. If you increase the pressure of a gas above a liquid, more of that gas is going to dissolve into your liquid. And I think once you see a picture of this, it's going to make a lot more sense. So remember, increase the pressure increases the solubility. So here we co we're coming back to our pistons. We used this earlier. So now, instead of just gas, we have some liquid down here. We have liquid. And then we have a gas up here. And we're able to increase the pressure of this gas just by pushing down on our piston. We're going to decrease the volume, which is going to make the pressure go up. So when we push this piston down, pressure goes up. And more of that gas is going to dissolve down into this liquid. The way I imagine this happening is as you push down on this piston, you're going to increase the pressure which is going to push some of that gas down into the liquid. You can imagine it's physically pushing the gas from here into the liquid. And so as you pull up, the, vol the volume is going to increase, the pressure is going to decrease, and so the gas is going to become less soluble. So use that premise to explain to me why when you take the cap off a soda bottle, it fizzes. Pressure is released. Pressure is released. And so when the pressure is released, why do you get bubbles? CO2 is coming out of the liquid. Right. Why was, the, why was it in there in the beginning? Because it was compressed in. Yes. So when they put that cap on, they did it under very, very, very high pressure. And so in this gap up here is a very high pressure carbon dioxide. When you take the cap off, immediately that pressure equalizes with the atmosphere. That's the hiss. It's the pressure escaping the bottom. But now the pressure 
is a lot lower than it was before. And so all of the CO2 in here is no longer soluble, right? This, the amount of CO2 you can dissolve at atmospheric pressure is a whole lot lower than when it's pressurized. And so it comes out of solution, it forms bubbles, and then comes out. What, if you want have a two liter, and you want it to keep it from going flat, what do you do? Close the cap. Close it tight. Close the cap tight. <laughs> How is that going to prevent it going from going flat? What happens in that bottle when you do that? Diffusion. Not diffusion. It goes back to the CO2 will go back into the Not going to go back into solution. You're increasing the pressure. Right. So imagine a half empty bottle. Okay, when you close that cap, some of the bubbles are going to come out of solution. Before they were dissolved, now they're bubbles in gas form. So now you now have more gas up here than you did when you capped it. So the pressure goes up. So the bubbles keep forming and forming and forming until you hit a point where the pressure up here provides enough solubility that no more bubbles form. And so the pressure will come up. Next time we hit the cap, all the hisses again, right? But it's never as strong of a hiss as the first time. So if you wanted to minimize the amount of bubbles you had to lose in order to reach that pressure, what could you do? Open it slowly. Now, so we're talking, but we're closing it. So it's open, we're about to close it. You want to minimize how many bubbles it's going to take in order to fill the top part until, until it reaches that, that needed pressure to make the bubble stop forming. Not shake. Shake is going to make all the bubbles come out at once. Has anybody ever seen somebody squeeze the two liter until the soda is almost at the top and then cap it? What that does is it reduces the amount of empty space. If you have a half full bottle, enough bubbles have to come out to pressurize half a bottle worth, worth of CO2. But if you squeeze it, you reduce the amount of empty space up here. So you only lose enough bubbles to fill a small amount of space again. Then when you open it, the, pr the air comes back in, the bottle re-expands, you pour it out, and then you s squeeze it again, so then, on the second time, you only lose enough bubbles to fill a small amount. Yes, that is a scuba diving cat. <laughs> is anybody in here scuba diving? Anybody at least familiar with scuba diving? Not at all. Okay, this ought to be fun. <laughs> so imagine you're a scuba diver. Imagine you're a scuba diver, okay? For, for right now, you're a scuba diver. And you go down in the ocean. What do you think happens to the pressure around you? It gets high. That, that you may have experienced before. Even if you're just swimming and you go down, you don't have to go very far until you feel that pressure in your ears, right? The pressure underwater is extremely high. So you go really deep in the ocean. The pressure around you goes way up. What's going to happen to the solubility of gases in your blood when you go down? It increases. The pressure goes up, and so the, the gases become more soluble in your blood. Now, even if you're, you're not a scuba diver, you're not really familiar, you may have be familiar with the idea of you don't want to come up too quickly. right? If you come up too quickly, what happens? You get the bends. So the bends is when you're down there, something bad happens, either a shark bites you, or you run out of oxygen or something like that, or your buddy runs out of oxygen and steals your, your regulator. And you need to get up quickly, because you're going to die if you stay down there. But you come up really quickly, and when you come up quickly, what happens to the solubility of the gas dissolved in your blood? The gas leaves your blood, and so your blood essentially looks like that. 
which you can imagine is not a good thing to have happen, right? So a couple things happen. Well, number one, you get oxygen in your capillaries, and so it, you get little bubbles. That's not oxygen, it's, it's air, mostly carbon dioxide at that point, probably. You get bubbles in your capillaries. Your capillaries carry blood. Capillaries are very small, though. So what how do you think happens if you get a bubble in a capillary? Nope. It's going to block it. Right. Capillaries are really, really small. So if you get a bubble, even if it's small, it's going to block it. And so the blood can't get past that bubble. So everything downstream of that bubble is not going to get any blood. But also, think of the heart as a pump. Your heart is a pump, right? Mm -hmm. you ever, have you ever had to prime a pump? Yeah. What happens if a pump loses prime? It doesn't pump anymore. So if you have a pump, that for the pump to continue running, it has to be filled with liquid. If a pump goes dry, you have to pour liquid into it to get it working again. If you get a big old bubble in your heart, you can't go in there and just pour blood into your heart. So your heart's going to, it's going to sit there and pump, but not going to do a thing at all. Okay? So you need to get this fixed pronto. Do you know how you fix the bends? Put them in that chamber. You put them in a hyperbaric chamber, right. So a hyperbaric chamber is a, is a small enclosed tube, basically, where they can increase the pressure very high. So they increase the pressure back to the point where it was underwater. Those bubbles will redissolve, and then they very, very slowly reduce the pressure in the capsule and so that when it comes out of solution, instead of forming bubbles, it just gets exhaled through your lungs, just like it normally would. And so you have to do this very slowly. So the next thing we're going to do is we're going to measure the concentration of our solution. So we've learned what our solutions are. Now we have to learn how to use them in the lab. And there are going to be a number of different units, different formulas that we're going to use to calculate our concentration. When we talk about concentration, what that means is how much solute you have compared to your solvent. So if you have the same amount of solvent and you add increasing amounts of solute, you're going to get increasing amounts of concentration. If you have the same amount of, let's say, salt, and you dissolve it in different amounts of water, if you dissolve it in the smallest amount of water, that's going to be the highest concentration. So the way we use concentration is probably the same way you think about concentration, right? Just in real life. We have a couple of terms that go with concentration. A saturated solution means that for the amount of solvent you have, it contains the maximum amount of solute. If you add any more of that solute, it can't dissolve. Okay, that is a saturated solution. Like saturated fats? Saturated fat, that's yes, but it's probably the easiest way. Think of, see people talk about the ground is being saturated. When you get a lot of rain, they'll say the ground is saturated. So if it rains anymore, it can't soak it up. So that causes flooding. Maybe you also, if you have a saturated paper towel, it can't hold any more water. Yes? Your stomach is saturated in your food. I've never heard that. Before. I've heard satiated. Satiated means. <laughs> Nice try, though. <laughs> A for effort. <laughs> A for effort. So that's a, a saturated solution contains the maximum amount allowed. Okay? Every pair of solute and solvent at a given temperature has a maximum amount. And there are books full of tables with this information. This is something you look up, not something you calculate. 
an unsaturated solution is not at that maximum yet. And so if you have a solution and you add more solute, okay, you have a solution. You don't know whether it's a saturated solution or an unsaturated solution. If you add more and it dissolves, was it a saturated solution or an unsaturated solution? Unsaturated. Because if you were already at that maximum, that extra wouldn't have dissolved. And so usually a saturated solution will have crystals sitting on the bottom. Because for you to be at a pure, exactly saturated solution would be lucky. Most likely you added a little bit too much. And that extra little bit is not going to dissolve. And so if you see undissolved solid at the bottom, that's going to be a saturated solution. If there's nothing at the bottom, it's probably not saturated. So we said solubility just tells us how much of the solute is per solvent. And so one way of looking at it is how much solute you have in grams per how many grams of solvent you have. So the solubility, that maximum amount you can dissolve, is usually given in this unit. Grams of solute per gram of solvent. Well, I think we'll come back. So it's a good example? Of yes, well, we'll come back to it. Is that a good example, like salt water, like the Dead Sea versus? Well, yeah, the Dead Sea oh. is, is not, it's not saturated because it, it, there's not salt sitting on the bottom, right? So they're, they're, they're both unsaturated, I think. The Dead Sea has a lot more in it yeah. than the regular ocean, but it's still not saturated. So not only is there a saturated solution and an unsaturated solution, but there's what we call a super saturated solution. So a super saturated solution actually does go above that maximum. But in order to do that, you have to have a very specific, special set of circumstances. Okay? Has anyone ever made rock candy? Yes. 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 How did you make rock candy? Do you remember? No. no. Sugar and water or something like that. Sugar and water? What did you do to it? You warm it up, and then you let it sit. Good, good teamwork. <laughs> so if you make rock candy, okay, you take a bunch of sugar, you heat it, you put it in water, and you heat it up. You put so much sugar in there that if you didn't heat up that water, it wouldn't all dissolve. But because you heated it up, it all dissolves. You then take a string, you put it on like a stick or something over your pot and let it hang down into the sugar solution, and you just let it cool. When it cools, the solubility decreases. You had to heat it up to get it to dissolve. When it cools, it's gonna come back out of solution in crystals. And when it does that, it's gonna form crystals on your string. And so you get these giant sugar crystals forming on your string, and so, or a stick, whatever you just put down in there. And so you end up basically with a lollipop. And so that's essentially what's going on in you know, the supersaturated solution. But with the supersaturated solution, there is no string or stick for those crystals to form on. For a crystal to form, it has to have a surface to form on. And so if you have a solution, imagine this is the sugar in water, we heat it up, it's all dissolved. It all dissolved, and then we cooled it back to room temperature. So now it is above the maximum sugar level that it can hold. But the inside of this flask was completely smooth. If you have completely smooth glass, crystals can't form on it. So even though they wanted to form, they couldn't. This is a super saturated solution. If you take one tiny crystal of sugar and drop it in, we call it a seed crystal because it's going to grow the rest of the crystals. As soon as you drop that in, now all of the sugar that's dissolved in here has something to grow on. 
So now you get crystals growing off of that, and it grows and grows and grows until almost all of the sugar is out of solution. We do this in organic chemistry all the time. Because the way we purify things in organic, organic chemistry is to dissolve them and crystallize them. So when you take something from solution and make crystals, the things that aren't the compound you want, a lot of times will stay in solution. And so then you, you separate your crystals out and your trash is dissolved in your solvent on here. But if we want it really, really pure, we can't go adding a seed crystal. Because that seed crystal is going to have impurities in it. So what we do is we take a spatula or a glass rod, just like you have in your drawer, and we scratch the bottom of the glass. You just take one little scratch, and all of a sudden it goes from nothing to that to that in about 10 seconds. So you just need that quick little surface for that first crystal to form, and then all the other crystals will form on top of that. Is that what happens with honey? I know they have to like processate oil. I don't want to mislead you because I don't know the exact answer. I can imagine two different things happening with honey. That could be it. That could be one explanation. Or the other, the other could be that the sugars eventually react with each other and make bigger sugars that aren't as soluble. I don't know which one's the, the correct. Because sometimes I've noticed the containers, they get kind of crystallized, some don't. Yeah. Another option would be, because honey has some, a small amount of water, if some of that water evaporates, some of the crystals are going to form when the oh. water leaves. Right. What's actually, which one is actually happening the most, I don't know. So this is showing what we talked about. If you increase temperature, the amount of sugar that you can dissolve will increase. So if you heat up your water to boiling, you can dissolve that much sugar. But if you then let it cool, so you dissolved almost 500 grams of sugar. You let it cool back to room temperature, which is about 20 Celsius, and only 200 can be dissolved. So you have 300 grams of sugar that have to form crystals. So that's what's gonna make your candy. Salt, though, is flat. No matter what temperature your water is, you can always dissolve the same amount of salt in it. So let's look at this example. So it says the solubility of sodium chloride is 38 grams per 100 grams of water at 25 degrees Celsius. That means for every 100 grams of water you have, you can dissolve a maximum of 38 grams of sodium chloride in it. This says we dissolved 45 grams of sodium chloride in 150 grams of water. We need to figure out whether it is unsaturated, saturated, or supersaturated. There are two ways that people like to do this. We'll do it both ways. You're welcome to figure out which way makes more sense to you, and then that will work for you going forward. I wouldn't say either way is easier or harder than the other, just which way your mind wants to work. So before I tell you either method, does anybody look at that problem and see a process that their mind wants to go through to figure this out? No. Okay. So the way my mind does this is I say, well, for with 100 grams, I can dissolve 38. I, but I have 150 grams. So I have 150. If I compare it to the rule, the rule is per 100. So that's 1.5. Does everybody see that? The rule is based off 100, and I have one and a half times that much. If I have one and a half times as much water, I can dissolve one and a half times as much salt. And so I would take 38 grams times 1.5. Somebody do that for me. 38 times 1.5. 
Fifty-seven grams. 